chapter 41 of Genesis, uh, the time uh, for Joseph to rise to power. And it's all God. It's all God's timing uh, in all of this. When we uh, kind of left off in our study last week, remember, he had been in prison for some time. We don't know how long. Uh, Thirteen years elapsed from the time he is sold into slavery to the time that uh, he's uh, 28 years old. Uh, when he interprets the dream of the butler and the banker, he's 30. Uh, when we get to chapter uh, 41, we'll see that in our context. Of those 13 years, we don't know how long he was in Potiphar's house and how long he was in, uh, in prison there. Uh, either way, it's been a, a tough uh, uh, period of time for him. Uh, but Joseph is able to make it through this whole thing uh, and still walk with the Lord, trust God, Know that God is with him no matter what. Know that God is preparing him for something in the future. And we'll kind of go back at the end and just talk about uh, how, do, how does Joseph do it? Because uh, uh, the great thing about this study is that here's a young man that never gets cynical, uh, that never gets bitter. You know, we've seen that all along. That We'll see that again in the way he names uh, his first two sons that are, that are born. It's just a, a great study. Solomon writing in Ecclesiastes 4.9, says that two, two are better than one because they, they get a good return for their work. If one falls, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Well, Joseph is the one man. He's the only righteous person in the entire uh, country of Egypt, but he has someone to help him up. It's God, and he knows it. And he knows that God is with him in the pit when his brothers betrayed him. He knows that God is with him in Potiphar's house when he's falsely accused. He knows that he's, uh, God is with him in the prison. And even when the butler forgets him, he still knows that God is with him. Well, let's take the request of Pharaoh. It comes after his, uh, his dreams in verses uh, 1 to 14. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. He slept again, dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads blighted by the east wind sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all of its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream in one night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass, just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. So, again, Joseph is 30 at this point. He's been two more years in the prison. He has spent at least half of his young life in slavery or in prison or in a combination of, of both. And now this time comes for this request to bring him before the Pharaoh. A couple aspects about this. The first one is the request is based obviously on the two dreams. Uh, Pharaoh sees himself by the river. That would be the Nile, uh, the sacred river to the Egyptians. Uh, and seeing the cattle there, that would have been normal. They would uh, pretty much submerge themselves in the heat of the day in the Nile as a retreat from the heat and the flies. Uh, and they were plump. They were good looking cows. And then seven other cows come along uh, that are not so good looking uh, lots of translations have different descriptions of them, ugly and thin. Uh, Hebrew literally is evil in appearance and thin of flesh. And then they attack, uh, they dismember, uh, and they eat uh, the other cow. So it's, a, uh, we might say, a grotesque and even a violent dream that he has. 
Uh, and so much that when Pharaoh wakes, he's shocked by it all. Now, keep in mind, we mentioned last week that dreams were very important and very significant to the Egyptians. And especially the Pharaoh, when he dreamed, he's the God King Pharaoh. So when he dreams, he believes that's the time that his mind is interacting with the divine. He's going to another level. So when he has a dream that is violent and it has something to do with possibly his life or Egypt, he doesn't really know. Uh, but when he awakes, it's like a nightmare that's just taken place. Uh, and he's more than a little concerned. Then he has a second dream. Seven heads of grain come up, one stalk. Uh, that are good than seven heads that are uh, blighted by the east wind. And then there is the attack of the cannibal ears. Sounds like a uh, 1960s uh, horror film. Uh, but uh, uh, it's in his dream. Uh, and based on that, now we see, secondly, his troubled spirit as he uh, uh, awakes. And certainly that's part of making the request to see, uh, to see Joseph. Uh, both dreams are closely parallel. Both feature cannibalism. Both ended in consuming violence, and both were built on the number uh, seven. So he is stunned uh, by this. Uh, it's interesting, the dream so stunned Pharaoh that uh, Moses, in writing, uses the word behold six times to indicate uh, the king's uh, response. So he calls for the magicians and the wise men of Egypt. Now, we don't know how many he had, but we know how many other pharaohs had, and sometimes it was in the hundreds. So when it says he called for all of them, He's not like five or six guys coming in trying to figure this out. Uh, he's, uh, there are dozens and possibly hundreds uh, around him the next morning trying to determine uh, what this all meant. Uh, so then the third request uh, aspect here is uh, based on the butler uh, remembering Joseph. Verse 9, then the chief butler spoke to Moses saying, notice he kind of couches this whole thing. I remembered my faults this day. <laughs> When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief uh, baker. So he introduces this, this idea. Uh, the term my fault uh, in the Greek Septuagint is actually the word sins. When I remember my sins and notice they're plural. He's not just talking about the sin in terms of whatever happened with him and Pharaoh, the reason he was there. He's certainly implicating the idea of, well, the ultimate sin was forgetting Joseph not bringing it up before. I want to at least suggest that uh, God caused him to not bring it up because God needed this timing to be perfect. Now, again, picture the idea. He, it's Pharaoh's birthday. He's released again. Everything is going great for Pharaoh. And he says, oh, by the way, there's this guy and he's a Hebrew and he's in prison. Uh, he interpreted my dream. And so I, I just, he wanted me to mention that to you. Well, hey, good. You have a good day too. Uh, but, you know, it's, it just... It just wouldn't have the impact uh, that it does this day. He has two nightmares that he believes are messages from the gods. He brings hundreds, possibly wise men, and nobody can figure it out. And now he says, but I remember this day, my own faults. And there was a man in prison. He could interpret dreams. Get that guy in here. Uh, you know, sometimes in our own, what we want to at least try to connect the dots, and we hope the Holy Spirit will help us do that, is that, uh, we go through, maybe know what Joseph went to, but we've all had our prisons. We've all <laughs> had our slaveries. You're going, yeah, that was my second job. You know, uh, we've all had, you know, the taskmaster, whoever it was, whatever it was. Uh, and we look back and we think about uh, how could God allow that to happen to me? No, God caused it. Uh, God had a reason. God had a purpose. Uh, and, and God caused that person to not remember you because there was, well, it wasn't time yet. Uh, and God's timing is perfect in everything. It's certainly not, not our timing. But uh, there's a lot we can learn from, uh, from Joseph. Uh, notice his, uh, the butler's account was uh, uh, fairly accurate, but he did some selective editing. He neglected to mention that the young Hebrew actually claimed to have no power to interpret dreams. He said it all came from his God. The cupbearer also gave the false impression impression that he took the initiative. Yeah, I, I, you know, I had this dream, so I called this guy over. That's not what happened. He was totally downcast. He was upset because he couldn't get to someone to interpret his dream that had a dream book, thinking of an Egyptian, a part of their own culture. Uh, and he's downcast. He's sad. Joseph notices. Joseph has compassion on him. No reason to, but he does. 
because he knows what it is to be downcast. He knows what it is to be lonely. He knows what it is to be in prison. So he has compassion on them, and Joseph offers to interpret the dream. He kind of overlooks that. And thirdly, the cupbearer made no mention that he failed to carry out the promise that he had made to Joseph. So the request then next is for Joseph to come from, uh, from prison. So basically, uh, in a flash, they kind of clean Joseph up, and uh, uh, Hebrews typically didn't shave, but Egyptians did. So they kind of sanitize him, Egyptize him, uh, to get him before Pharaoh. Now keep in mind, probably Joseph looked like a, an Egyptian prior to the time in the dungeon when he was working for Potiphar. Uh, he probably, again, he's 17. He hasn't heard Hebrew in many years. The only language he speaks now is Egyptian. It's not like he uh, needs a translator. I'm sure he speaks it fluently at this point. And, uh, and he knew what it was to look and dress and appear in such a way that he could appear uh, before Pharaoh in this, in this well. And he was a stunning young guy. We've already, we've already seen that and some of the descriptions of him. But God had orchestrated all of the timing of the dreams and again, the reason that his brothers needed to be jealous and bitter was against him because if they weren't, they would have never thrown him into the pit. Uh, they needed to have a, some amount of compassion. Somebody had to step up so that he's not killed, so that he's only sold into slavery, so that he could get into Potiphar's house, so that he could be falsely accused of rape, so that he could get into this prison because it had to be for Potiphar, who really doesn't believe his wife. He believes Joseph, who he, so he's not executed. He gets him into the house of the captain of the guard. He's got to get there so he can be there and wait so he can be there to interpret the dreams so he can wait two more years for this occasion. Uh, that's a lot of waiting. That's a lot of patience. That's a lot of uh, trusting the Lord. But that occasion has come. Well, let's look at the response of Joseph now uh, in this situation in verses 15 to 36. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream, I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then, behold, seven cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness as I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. When they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. So I awoke. Also I saw in my dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. Then behold, seven heads withered thin, uh, and blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them, and the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians. There was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them, seven years of famine will arise and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh. And let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine." Man, it's a good thing that Joseph was working on that MBA and that, you know, while he was in prison during that time. It's a pretty good plan, don't you think? 
Well, let's look at his response. There are several things about it that are important. The first thing we note is that he wasn't intimidated. I don't, I don't know if you've ever had an occasion where you were, you were brought up before someone in somebody's office somewhere, and wow, it was impressive. It's easy to be intimidated. He goes from a dungeon to standing before Pharaoh in, in one day, in a matter of, uh, a matter of hours. Uh, he could have been impressed, and there could have been a temptation to tell Pharaoh whatever Pharaoh wanted to hear uh, in that situation. Uh, Chuck Colson, uh, in his book, Kings and Conflicts, kind of describes his time when he was still part of the White House staff uh, under Richard Nixon, uh, and uh, before his conviction in Watergate, his prison, uh, his going to, uh, uh, coming to faith in Christ, and, uh, uh, and so forth, and the uh, entire ministry the Lord gave him uh, that he's established, and of course, Chuck's uh, enjoying the reward of that with the Lord now. But uh, in this book, he describes how he could bring people uh, into the whole entourage of the White House and show them around in such a way. Well, he put it, he could turn them into, from lions into lambs before they ever got into the Oval, oval Office. Uh, he describes the aura that he used to pacify visitors, uh, hosting them first in the executive dining room of the West Wing. He said he would escort his... Uh, Guests passed saluting guards down a long corridor lined with, with uh, photographs of the president in action. Uh, then at the door of the dining room, he would pause and point to a door and hushed tones say, that's the situation room, from which they would uh, uh, conjure up images of computer screens and generals and maps, of course, which none of them are there. They're down at the Pentagon uh, doing their work, but uh, it was all for uh, effect. He said the ambience of the executive dining room was overwhelming with its rich ham rub mahogany walls lined with uh, a row of red jacketed Navy stewards uh, around the tables. Uh, he said usually the staunchest advers adversaries would begin to soften uh, at that point. Uh, and then he would take them uh, to a tour of the uh, Oval Office itself. And then there would be a prearranged but appearing to be impromptu meeting with the president himself from which he would take out of drawer a pair of his own gold-plated uh, cufflinks, uh, you know, emblazoned on them the seal of the present and offer them as a personal gift to this particular guest that was standing there. And let me read the quote from the book. He says, he says, no one ever showed outward hostility. Most except the labor leaders forgot their best rehearsed lines. They nodded when the president spoke. And in those rare instances when they disagreed, they did so apologetically, assuring the president that they personally respected his opinion. But here's the point I want us to see. Ironically, none were more uh, compliant than the religious leaders. Of all people, they should have been the most aware of the sinful nature of man and the least overwhelmed by pomp and protocol but theological knowledge sometimes wilts in the face of worldly power. But Joseph didn't. He doesn't wilt. He, he's, uh, he's there. Uh, he is not intimidated. And therefore, the second thing about his response is, well, in it, he gives God the glory. Verse 15, Pharaoh says, I've had a dream. No one can interpret it. I've heard that you can interpret it. What is Joseph saying? Well, I am pretty good at this. <laughs> I have this special, no, he, he, just, he says, uh, it's not me. Uh, actually, when he, when he says it's not in me, it's one word in the Hebrew. It's just like, not me. I can't do it, uh, but God can. And notice it's not a God can do it. It's Ha Elohim. It's the God, it's my God. It's the God of the Hebrews that can interpret dreams. In the assertion that my God is greater than the, you and all the gods in Egypt. And he is the only one that can say what's going to happen in the future. I would say he's not intimidated. Uh, and I would say all of those years of preparation, uh, and if it took being a slave, if it could, took being in prison, if it took all that he went through, God had certainly prepared him for this day. When he says that God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace, one translation says God would give Pharaoh an answer that will save him. Because what's at stake if the dreams are true, if the interpretation of Joseph is true, is not just they'll have a famine for a year, which they've had before, uh, and it's devastating when it would happen. 
So when this announcement is made to the country, uh, they are more than a little concerned. One year drought is devastating. Again, they don't have rain. The rain fur rains further south. It comes up through the Nile, and then it overflows for about three months. They have uh, lots of irrigation all set up, and they're able to water their crops and produce uh, enough bread to last them through, uh, through the year. That's why you remember Abraham in a time of drought, they head to, uh, to Egypt. And we've got a lot of carved reliefs of people coming from Canaan to make that journey during a time of drought. We also have carved reliefs of Egyptians that look like this during a time of drought because they're literally starving to death. So this isn't something they heard about once on the news. This is something some of them have lived through, but the unimaginable is that would be repeated for seven times. Uh, and Joseph asserts here that God is the one that's in control. Uh, the Pharaoh embellishes a little more. It talks about how ugly the dream was, how repulsive it was, and so forth. Uh, and so then thirdly, Joseph responds by telling Pharaoh that God is the one who's given them the dreams, and it's for a purpose. Uh, it's to warn them of something that's going to happen in the future. Notice that he puts God at the forefront when he begins, verse 25. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. In the middle of the interpretation, verse 28, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. And at the end of the interpretation, verse 32, and the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. One writer, Walter Bruggeman, said of this uh, remarks by Joseph, the future in Egypt does not depend upon Pharaoh. He does not get to decide. In fact, Pharaoh is irrelevant and marginal to the future of the kingdom. Joseph has calmly announced to the Lord of Egypt that the future is out of his hands. In Genesis 41, it is clear that Pharaoh can cause no future, nor can he resist the future that God will bring. Joseph's pretty convincing that God is the God of creation. He's the one that's in control of the future. He's the one that's been with Joseph through his entire experience. Uh, it reminds us of the words of Jesus before Pontius Pilate in John 19, 10, where Pilate says, then Pilate said to him, to Jesus, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you, power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it's been given you from above. Pilate, you're not really in charge. You might think you're in control. You might think you're a ruler. You're really not a ruler. Ken Hughes says this, we must remember this in uncertain days. When evil regimes thumb their noses at justice and millions cheer them on, when dark kings prevail with seemingly impunity and righteous people are engulfed by the night, Remember that these kings do not make history, but rather God uses them to affect his purposes. They may not be convinced of that, those that are out there. Uh, nonetheless, it's true. Uh, Joseph responds, uh, lastly, by giving his advice, which uh, uh, is uh, certainly worth looking at. And to uh, say the least, it's brilliant. Uh, what would you do in this situation? And <laughs> notice he doesn't interpret the dream. That would have been enough. And he could have just stepped away. He says, therefore, and he, and he just jumps, jumps right in with this, with this whole plan. It's a pretty good one. Collect 20% for seven years. Uh, de, uh, there needs to be a decentralization of the stored grain so that when it comes time for distribution, uh, it can be made available to everyone. Yet the stored grain must be in centers of population so that it can be protected because in those seven years of famine, there could be a, a few wars fought over this grain. So it needs to be in the cities themselves. And then lastly, he says, make sure you've got good leadership, officials out there overseeing, but one guy that knows what's going on. Uh, again, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. And, uh, and some might even think, well, Joseph was certainly setting himself up for a job, and I don't think so. I think this was the furthest thing from his mind. As far as he knows, he delivered the goods, told him the message, did what God caused, wanted him to do, and he's on his way back to the dungeon, as far as he knows. I mean, you know, it's like we know the rest of the story, right? Joseph doesn't know the rest of the story. He's just being obedient to God. He doesn't know what's going what's to happen. 
we were, again, when we were on the East Coast with our friends back there, Chris and Lauren, and uh, Lauren's still in a Marine res Reserve unit, but he's working for, had been working for a private uh, defense contractor and been going well, and somebody from another company saw him and uh, wanted to get together with him and basically offered him a, a position with a, a newer company just starting out, and it was a pretty, it was a good offer and everything, and uh, and so uh, Chris said, well, I, I've got to tell you, though, I, I go, I'm, I'm very interested, but you need to know this about me. God comes first, my family will come second, and this company will always come third. And if you can live with that, I'll work with you. And the guy said, that's the reason I want you, because I've observed your life. I need somebody I can trust. You know, and we, we don't often, you know, formulate that or think that that's the thing that the well, people in the world are looking for. We're going to find that's exactly why Pharaoh takes Joseph and makes him that man. He sees him as the one who is discerning and wise, which takes us to the re, uh, from the response of Joseph to his rise to power, verse 37. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off of his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. He clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name uh, Zaphanath Paaneah. And he gave him as a wife, uh, as Azanath, the daughter of Pati. Pharaoh, priest of On, so Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. So his rise to power is based on his relationship with the Lord. We know first, knows what he says in verse 38, uh, a man in whom is the spirit of God. So Pharaoh, however ignorantly, is really praising the God of the Hebrews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the, certainly the God of, of Joseph. He makes him prime ministry, viceroy, and uh, whatever title we might uh, uh, attach to that, he's the number one in command next only to Pharaoh. Now, we mentioned in our study of Moses uh, and his birth and his mom and all that. Uh, I thought you'd be interested in Egyptology for Mother's Day, of course, as we went through that. But uh, we talked about this idea that uh, Moses is, well, the woman that raised him, that princess and her name, and even showed you a picture of her, if you recall, uh, and her father was Tut Moses the uh, first, and when he comes to the throne, he remembers not Joseph because he doesn't want to happen what happened with the Hiskos reign. What happens under him? That is the guy that Joseph is talking to is not Egyptian. He's not Egyptian, and in fact, he's some archaeologists would suggest they believe they have evidence they are Amalekites. They would also be shepherds. The Egyptians had a disdain for shepherds, but this guy is not a problem. It's not a problem that he's Hebrew. It's not a problem when he brings his family there later. In fact, he gives them Goshen in the Nile Delta, one of the better uh, properties in, in all the country. Uh, so it's not a strange thing that he does what he does with Joseph, but he does it because of the spirit of God in the man. And that's, that's what he sees. Uh, his rise to power included these gifts of uh, royalty. Uh, the signet ring of Pharaoh would actually, uh, as you might imagine, an oval hieroglyphics with uh, the Pharaoh's name on it. We don't have this ring, but we have other rings from other Pharaohs in this dynasty. Excuse me. And, uh, uh, and actually, you can go online and take a look at it and see exactly what the, uh, the ring looks like. The garments of fine linen. Uh, almost transparent, were worn by uh, court officials, uh, and the gold chain that hung around his neck was known as the gold of valor, uh, and, uh, and actually we have that uh, carved out in figures as well. So it wasn't a gold chain like a rap singer would wear. It was, it was massive. Uh, there was a lot of gold involved. And then he was treated to the inaugural parade. So he had his own limo, 
and a guy going before him saying, uh, bow, bow the knee. Uh, the third thing about his rise to power, it included a new name uh, and a new wife. So Pharaoh certainly is intent on Egyptizing, if that's a word. Joseph, remember uh, Daniel, when his rise to power in Babylon, same thing. Teach him in all the ways of Babylon. Give him a new name. They were trying to get him to blend with the culture uh, around him. And there's certainly an attempt here. He calls his name Zaphanath Panea, generally understood to be uh, God speaks and lives. In the Coptic language of Egypt today, it would mean revealer of secrets. So that certainly could have been a, a translation of what it meant because he was that in terms of the dream. Uh, but in some hydroglyphs of ancient uh, Egypt, if you look at some of those, some of those experts would say his name meant savior of the world. And uh, we could go on and on talking about the typology of Joseph and how he is like Christ himself, betrayed by his brothers, uh, does uh, become the savior of the world in that sense. His wife, uh, Azanath, was of uh, aristocratic blood, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Uh, this temple that her father was at is 10 miles northeast of Cairo, the center of worship of the sun god Ray. So he's somebody. Uh, in fact, from her family, some pharaohs would, well, that's where their wives came from. Uh, so this is no small thing to give her to him uh, in marriage. He's clothed like an Egyptian. His name was Egyptian. His language was Egyptian. His wife was Egyptian. His father-in-law was the leading Egyptian sun worshiper. And we would say at this point in time, Joseph's life is in its greatest peril of all times. You know, when you're in a pit, there's only one way to look up <laughs> to, to God. But when you have it all, and all the power, all the influence, well, many would say this is his most dangerous time. It all begins, of course, as we said, with a request from Pharaoh because of the dreams. Uh, we see that Joseph's response is, uh, is outstanding. It's all about giving God the glory. There's the rise to power. Well, let's look at his rule in verse 46 to 57. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in the seven plentiful years, the ground was brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came from uh, Azanath, the daughter of Pati, uh, Pharaoh, the priest of On, bore him. Joseph called the name of his firstborn son Manasseh. For God has made me forget all my toil and my father's house. Then the name of a second he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended. And the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in the land, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, do. The famine was all over the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all the land. So uh, certainly the rule of Joseph was marked by his faith and his faithfulness. Uh, notice that he absolutely believes that what God said is, is going to happen. Uh, and uh, notice verse 46, And Joseph went out of the presence of Pharaoh and went out through the land of Egypt. He says, give me that limbo back here again. I mean, he's like, that was really good. Uh, thanks for the parade, but uh, I got work to do. And he's out there doing it uh, right away. I mean, this guy could have been kicked back for seven years. I mean, it was a super abundance uh, of crops and so forth and blessing that was coming in at that time. But he certainly lived in a sense that the clock was ticking uh, and that he had uh, work to do. Uh, and again, the people of that period, when he said famine is coming, uh, they knew exactly what he was talking about. The second thing about the rule, very important, is the naming of his sons. He may have an Egyptian name. His wife may have an Egyptian name. They may speak an Egyptian language. He may look like an Egyptian, 
but he gives his two kids Hebrew names, uh, Manasseh and, and Ephraim. Manasseh means, for God has made me forget, notice how much all of my toil, all of the slavery, all the years, all the betrayal, all the false accusations, all the time in a dungeon, God, God has made me forget uh, all of it in my father's house. He takes this opportunity uh, that we see here, what we've really believed all along, that he believed that God was with him, God was working, God had a plan, God had a dream, God had a purpose for his life. Uh, it, it's not that God doesn't love him when he's in the dungeon, he does. He's just, he's just totally trusting the Lord. And he says that God has worked in my life in such a way as that I've kind of forgotten all of that. And that's an amazing thing. Could have been sent very, I mean, this kid could have been so cynical. He could have been so bitter. He could have been so angry. I was talking to a young guy uh, just this week and sharing with him a little bit. And, uh, and you know, it was, it was good. It was a good opportunity. But he said to me at one point, you know, that's good. I'm talking to him about the Lord, but I am so angry. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot uh, that can make us angry in this life. Uh, but Joseph, whatever the temptation to go there, was able to bring those thoughts captive uh, because of his relationship with the Lord. And he's saying, it's not something I did, it's something God did uh, in me. And that's why, that's why it's just so worth it to study the life of Joseph that we could try to glean from him. How did he do it? Ephraim, uh, he names him, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. It's, it's not like he's forgetting the, the past altogether, but he says that even in the midst of it, God allowed me to be fruitful. I mean, in a sense, he was able to bless other people. You know, we only know the stories uh, of his witness to and giving God the glory through the dream interpretation of the butler and the baker and then later Pharaoh. We don't have a lot of other details. But he says, even in the midst of it, no matter how bad it was, God caused me to be fruitful. And we have a tendency to think, man, this is really hard. And if God ever gets me through all of this and I can get to the other side of it, I know that somehow God will use it someday. And Joseph said, that wasn't like that for me. He goes, right in the middle of it, God was still uh, being fruitful and using my life. One writer said, the pain can cloud our perspective. Uh, but it never, it never clouded the perspective of of Joseph. He was always filled with gratitude, optimism, uh, and, and hope. Uh, the other thing about his rule, well, it did come in a great time of famine. It all happened exactly the way it was said. And notice the crisis involved, quote, uh, the text says, all the earth. I don't know if Joseph is looking ahead or thinking about it. Uh, even southern, what we'd call southern Canaan fell under the the rule of Egypt during this particular time period. Uh, and I don't know if he wonders if he'll ever see his brothers again or if this is the occasion. I mean, he'll see them. They're going to bow down to him. Is, is this it? Is this what this is all about? Uh, I mean, he's thinking to try to save Egypt, the land. Uh, he's trying to save the people of Egypt, believing that's why God brought him there and gave him the authority and the responsibility to do that. I don't know that he really is thinking and he's going to save his own family as well. Uh, but certainly we're going to see that uh, in our next study. So how does, how does he do it? How does Joseph do it? Well, again, uh, the 13 years of testing, all that he's been through, as I've uh, said before, he believed God was with him in controlling the circumstances of his life. Uh, we would say, Paul's words, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his uh, his purpose. Uh, Joseph hang, hung on to that. Secondly, he believed God's word, uh, including for him, it was the covenant promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to him himself. And certainly, uh, we need to hang on to God's word as well. Thirdly, he believed that uh, they were God-given dreams. They weren't natural dreams. They weren't evil dreams. They were divine dreams. They were God-given dreams, uh, which spelled out to him that his life had meaning and purpose and God had a plan for him. And, uh, and that's something that we all know to be true as well uh, and that we need to hang on to uh, also. Uh, and he believed uh, that uh, God was standing with him uh, during the, the whole time. 
I got, you know, I, I didn't do this in the first service. I just got to tell you this one, one story. When Kathy and I were at the, uh, uh, the Family Research Council, that first uh, uh, pastor's conference in D.C., that first evening, uh, it was like a reception thing, and, uh, and uh, we were, uh, people were kind of milling around. We were sitting at the table. There was a few couples there from Maine and all over the place, and we were enjoying fellowship with them. There were several seats by us, and uh, a guy came and sat uh, next to me, and, and he... <laughs> He's a lot bigger than I am, and uh, kind of, it's like, whoa, you know, it's a big guy, and uh, kind of had that uh, James Earl Jones kind of voice, like, wow, you know, it just kind of grabs your attention, and he sat down, and I, I looked at him, he introduced himself, and the name kind of like, I kind of know that name somehow, you get that, this is somebody, you know, kind of a, a sense, and uh, he began talking and, uh, and sharing a little bit and everything, and and then as he's talking, it's like kind of all coming together. And I know that I've seen him on TV. You know, he's one of these guys you see on Fox or CNN being interviewed. And then I kind of trying to look at his little name. Down. Okay, he's with Family Research Council. Like, okay, I see his name. It all kind of starts coming together. I know who this is. And uh, his name is Kim Blackwell. And he's, <clears throat> we're talking about the conference, different things. And he, he wrote a book uh, about uh, uh, what it would be like if President Obama got elected. Uh, uh, and he'd just written another book about kind of the condition of the country we're, we're in right now. We're, we're talking about that. And this is a guy who had been the undersecretary to HUD uh, and uh, traveled uh, and uh, worked uh, extensively for the United Nations. He's been around the block a few times. Uh, very, very uh, brilliant guy. And he, was, uh, when it, he starts telling us this story about, uh, about his grandfather. And that, that's what I want to get to. But uh, just kind of let, let you know how it all came about. But he's telling us about his grandfather. He said his grandfather uh, uh, was in the Olympics in 1926. And, uh, and at that time, there was the, the big deal was uh, who was the fastest man in the world. The Olympics are coming up here in July, and, and his grandfather was one of those guys. It was going to be that guy or another guy uh, from Europe. And it was a big thing. So he, he, his grandfather qualified for a few other events as well. And he goes, <laughs> he goes to the, the Olympic Games in 1926. And he gets there, and once he's there, uh, he's told, I didn't mention he's African-American, 1926. He gets there, he's told that his grandfather, because you're African-American, they didn't use that phrase then, they said, because of that, you can't run the 100. Uh, we'll let you do the long jump. We're going to disqualify you from this event. And uh, after all the years of training and, and preparation, so there wouldn't be the big showdown. Uh, he said his grandfather went ahead, competed in the long jump, and uh, won a bronze medal. And he asked his grandfather, <clears throat> you know, weren't you bitter about that? Weren't you angry about that? He says, well, no, not really. He says, because, you know, the other guy that was going to run, he didn't run either. But he chose not to run. His name was Eric Little. And said so he chose not to run because to him, going into the ministry, that was the Sabbath, and he believed it was wrong for him to run on the Sabbath. You've probably seen the story of Chariots of Fire. So he said... They wouldn't let me run, but he chose not to run. Yeah, I could have been bitter. I could have been angry. But instead, I got to meet him and talk with him. And I saw a Christian man of integrity. And that was worth my trip to Europe. He goes, I came back from the 26 Olympics with a bronze medal and the most powerful witness I've ever seen of what it is to be an authentic Christian. He says, I came back blessed. Could have gone down a couple of different ways, couldn't it? Could have been a very angry young man. But he, he saw it from what God would teach him in it and what then he could teach his kids and grandkids through it rather than allow the, what could have been to, to eat him up through the whole thing. It's a powerful story. And uh, I think it helps us understand a little bit. There's, there's some Josephs out there. And, uh, and God wants us all to be this way. And it's not an easy thing to deal with the hurts and the things of the past and what God said and who did what and, and all of that. But it is possible. Joseph said it was a work of God in him. And that's why he names his son Manassas. And he says, and God was even fruitful through it. So he names his other son Ephraim. Amazing. Amazing.